in order to understand what Buddhism <coughs> is in more detail, we should continue to look into the matter of independence, especially independence as to our study of Buddhism. It's been a couple thousand years since the Buddha first taught, and so over the years obviously things have changed. In things have been passed along by memory and have been written down, and it's certain that over the years things have been added, there have been improvements made, additions made, things have been lost, and so forth over the 2,600 years that have of the history of Buddhism. <coughs> But there need not be any fear regarding this matter. There's, we shouldn't worry that, that something has been lost or that we'll be incorrect in our practice or misunderstand because we have the fundamental principle of being, being free and independent regarding our study of Buddhism. We don't have to depend on the, all the traditions that have been passed down or not even on the recorded words of the Buddha himself. The, the main body of the Buddhist scriptures is called the Tipitika, the three baskets. And we don't, we don't have to blindly accept even this as the, the pure teachings of Buddhism, let alone the later commentaries and opinions and interpretations that have developed in the, the centuries after the Buddha up to the present day. We don't have to worry that any of this might be wrong, and we have no way of, of historically proving who said what anyway. But because we are, can be independent, we can check these things all out for ourselves. And so it's not really a problem for us of, the, of whether these things might have some mistakes creeping in. As we mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> the approach of Buddhism is essentially scientific. However, it's a spiritual science. And when we say it's a spiritual science, this means that we must study and learn Buddhism through our own spiritual experience. And what that means is that <clears throat> we learn Buddhism. We undertake this spiritual science by, by dealing with suffering as it occurs to the mind and then searching out the cause of that suffering and then learning how to remove that cause in order to be free of suffering and, and misery. In this way, there is direct spiritual experience of these matters. And so it's a spiritual, spiritual science. If we approach it in this way, we will have no difficulties regarding any of the scriptures, whether they are right or wrong or any mistakes or inaccuracies have crept in. We, these will not trouble us because we'll be able to verify things for ourselves. When we, we take this <coughs> approach to <coughs> To Buddhism of treating it as a spiritual science there's a whole lot of things then that we don't really have to bother with such as environmental external cultural factors a number of Westerners when they decide to study Buddhism they go off and study Indian history Indian geology Indian politics Indian all kinds of things about India 
and they spend quite a lot of time in in a way that is essentially unnecessary because what they're studying isn't really Buddhism itself. People studying comparative psychology and, and things like this. Even to <coughs> not only are all those kind of external things unnecessary, even just studying the the Buddha's life isn't really essential. In the Buddha's time, nobody was going around reading up on the Buddha's life and memorizing all the facts of it, as is done nowadays. Or another thing that is popular is books about Buddhism in China, Buddhism in Tibet, Buddhism in Burma, Buddhism in Thailand. And all these books are essentially unnecessary too because they don't really deal with Buddhism itself. They're just dealing with this, all the cultural accoutrements, all the cultural additions that have been put onto Buddhism in this, in these various countries. All of this is, is essentially unnecessary. We don't need to worry about learning all that stuff. All we need to deal with is the basic facts of, of suffering as it occurs in the human mind and then the the way out of suffering making this direct experience spiritual experience of things is all that we really need to study in buddhism we don't believe or maintain that the dhamma has been revealed to us by god and so we have no no need or interest in quoting God or relying on the authority of God or of depending on any so-called God's revelation. Instead, we can, we can learn all these things, we can discover all these things within ourself. The only authority is our own direct personal spiritual experience. And so we we do this by what we call in the Pali language Sikha, Sikha, which is now often translated in modern Thai, study. But there's much more to Sikha than just study in the modern sense of the word. If we say study, we also mean to train, not just to learn something in an intellectual way, but to to really do it and so it's integrated fully into our understanding by by repeated training and by going deeper and deeper into something experientially so through sikha we can really get to know these things the word sikha can be also explained as to to look at oneself Ika means look or see, and sa means oneself. So sa, ika, sika means to look at oneself until seeing oneself, and then until knowing oneself. This is the essence of study, to know, to look at oneself, see oneself, and then know oneself. In this way, we can study Buddhism we can study Buddhism like a surgeon. A surgeon when has a patient and needs to cut into the patient, find out what's wrong and solve the problem. We can take this surgeon's approach to Buddhism as well. To whenever there's a problem, to cut into it and then search out the cause of the problem find out what the, the opposite of the problem would be, what the solution would be, and find the way of achieving that solution. This is what we call practicing like a surgeon. It's this basic scientific approach, once again, to, to discovering Buddhism. Cut open the problem, find its cause, find the solution to the problem how to remove the cause, 
and find the way of achieving that solution. If to study or learn about Buddhism isn't what people would normally think about these things, the only way is to really practice it. The way to come to this experience is to try it out, to test it, to do it, to practice it in real life. This is the where one learns Buddhism through practice. One can only study these things through practice, through, through actually doing it. It's not really necessary to, to have any books or any, any schools or classrooms for these things. It isn't even necessary to have any scriptures. In fact, in the Buddha's time, they didn't, they didn't have any of, any of these things at all. A lot of the things we've developed in later times, all these scriptures, these schools and universities of Buddhism, and all these different things, didn't even exist in the Buddha's time. They weren't, they weren't necessary. All they did back then was they practiced it. They directly confronted problems in life. They directly faced any suffering in life and then just went right into that like a surgeon, like a scientist, to find out the cause and to learn how to solve that problem. And this is the only way to really learn Buddhism, by directly dealing with the problems and the suffering that arises in life. When one finds the way to solve these problems, that, that is the practice of Buddhism and the, the study of Buddhism through solving these problems. Now we'd like to say something about knowledge, <coughs> which in the Pali language is called jnana, jnana, or knowledge. Jnana has many, many levels. And in short, there are at least three fundamental levels of, of knowledge. The first is called sutta. Sutta is knowledge that has been learned, heard from others, read from books, and so on. Secondhand knowledge. Then there is knowledge which is jinta, which means that comes from thought. To take what we've heard, think about it, reason about it investigate it using logical tools or whatever. That realizes that comes leads to a second level of knowledge, a little bit more certain and useful. And then the third level is called bhavana, bhavana or the knowledge that comes from development leading to direct realization. If we practice that thing that we've heard about and thought about until we have direct realization of it. That is the highest level of knowledge which we call bhavana. To really <clears throat> know something, especially something like Buddhism, we have to have all three levels of knowledge. It's not enough just to have the first or the second. And so it's necessary to improve our knowledge until it includes all three of these levels. Nowadays, education in this world only involves the first kind of knowledge, the sutta. All the schools and universities in the world now only are, are passing on this information and having the students learn it and memorize it. There are these universities filled up with millions of volumes, but that really isn't able to help us to get to the heart, the heart level of Buddhism. If we just hear about it or read about it, that's not going to do us much good. If we go and take what we've heard and learned and think about it and reason about it in the, the way that scientists do, to, to find, to figure out, well, what is suffering? What's the cause of suffering? What's the way out of suffering? This, this is more, more helpful. But in the end, it's necessary to have a direct realization 
of whatever it is. To just think about and investigate what suffering is and what the end of suffering is, is not yet direct realization. We have to see that, experience it directly within our own, our own hearts. And then we call this realization. It's only this realization that leads to enlightenment. It's not really possible to, to understand something important without this third level. If there's anything important in life that you want to know, it's necessary to investigate it through all three levels. And so this is the approach we take to Buddhism. This realization we have to understand is the, the first kind of knowledge can be taught by other people. But when it comes to realization, nobody can teach it. Nobody can have the realization for you. It has to happen directly, personally, independently, individually, completely free. Nobody can do it for us and nobody can teach it to us. But this is the level of realization that is true wisdom and is the only way to really understand what Buddhism is about. So there's, you needn't rely upon anything external. You don't have to depend on or to put your hopes on anything outside yourself. This is completely unnecessary. The school of Buddhism is something that you must open within yourself. If you have if you want to have a library, you must find it within yourself, within your own direct experience and realization. This is the only valid school or library for learning Buddhism, the one, one within, in yourself. And so those of you who have come from Europe, Australia, North America, in order to to learn Buddhism here, you won't actually be able to learn Buddhism itself in this way by coming from who knows where. Because what we're doing now is still an external kind of learning. All we can do right now is for you to learn the way of learning Buddhism, the method to discover Buddhism. That's what we're talking about now. To, ever, to actually learn it, you have to sit down and open that school within your own hearts to look with inside until there is your own direct understanding, until you clearly realize these issues within yourself. That's how you can learn Buddhism for yourself. But at this time, we're, we're discussing the way to learn Buddhism. This is all you can get from another person. You cannot learn Buddhism from anybody but yourself. And so this, this Buddhism is a study, we could also say, of the mind. You could even call it psychology if you wanted. But it's important to distinguish it from the psychology that is commonplace in, in the world. The psychology that they're learning all around the world is not the same as the psychology that we study in Buddhism. That kind of psychology out there has the, the main purpose of gaining personal advantages. The people who study this psychology are using it to their, their own advantage. This isn't what psychology is about in Buddhism. In psychology, instead of trying to build up and develop one's ego for one's own benefit, in Buddhism, the thing is to become liberated from all attachments, to let go of all these, these weights. And so if you want to see Buddhism as a psychology, don't go and confuse it with the ordinary selfish psychology that is most common in the world. And so we study 
Buddhism as this special kind of psychology for letting go of things, getting getting free of things, being liberated from things. And then in from this way, then when it's this study is realized, then we can use that to tremendous benefits. In Buddhism, psychology is to help free the mind from from prison. The mind is now the mind is a prisoner. The, the mind is often or commonly a prisoner to to positive things and negative things. But Buddhism is a psychology which aims to liberate the mind from from those positiveness when there the mind attaches to positive things and gets trapped in them is deceived by positive things and negative things by positivism and negativism these become prisons for the mind and so the mind becomes a prisoner buddhist psychology aims to help the mind escape from these prisons so that it can be free when we are imprisoned in something positive this is because there is a positive ego which goes and gets has gotten attached to that thing and turned it into a prison if we attach to something as positive then this will bring up a sense of ego a positive kind of ego and then this positive thing becomes a prison a trap if one attaches clings to something negative then there arises a negative kind of ego and then this this negative thing becomes a prison for that ego in this way positive things and negative things become prisons and they imprison the positive and the negative egos that arise please don't don't fall into this problem please avoid this because as soon as there is this attaching to things and then this positive and negative ego then there is a problem and this problem is suffering is miserable and this is why we say that it's a prison these positive and negative things are prisons so don't attach to them in this way and then one can be free of these prisons if we haven't studied these things carefully then we go and grasp at positive things and negative things we haven't seen the truth of these things and when we haven't seen the truth then we take them to be positive and negative however if we speak of the truth itself the truth is neither positive or negative it's completely free of positiveness and negativeness so if we see the truth of things we don't see them as positive and we don't see them as negative and then we are free of them but if we if we are deceived by them by not in heaven seeing their truths then we take things to be sometimes positive and sometimes negative or we we see things as happy and painful or as as happy and suffering happiness and suffering in buddhism this this doesn't work this isn't this isn't going to help us and so we see that to see things in this way doesn't work or to see things as good and bad good good is positive bad is negative this this isn't the truth or to see things as getting to see them as losing all of these are are just pairs of opposites dualities and none of these are the truth and so in buddhism we we don't want to be caught up by these we don't want to we don't want to be have anything to do with these these dualities even the duality of heaven and hell 
even this isn't going to help us. And so in Buddhism, we're, we're not interested in heaven, in hell. So all these dualities are not the truth. They're just deceptions that occur when we haven't seen the truth itself. And so we're going to study in a way that helps us to see the truth of things so that we're not deceived by the positive and the negative. This point was, was even understood by the Jewish people who wrote the Old Testament of Christianity. In the third chapter of Den Genesis, God warns Adam and Eve not to attach to positive and negative. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the meaning of this is not <coughs> attaching to the positive and the negative. If we go and cling to positive and negative, then we are born in positive and negative ways and spend spend our time spinning around, cycling around, circling around in positive and negative. And this is just a bunch of misery to go spinning around in all this positiveness and negativeness. So the thing is not to attach in that way, to, to get free from, to escape from positiveness and negativeness. This was taught in the very, on the very first page of the, the Old Testament. And this is the basic point in our study in practice. This is the way to get free of, of pain and suffering. All our difficulties in this matter happen because our ancestor went and ate the fruit of that, that tree of knowing positiveness and, and negativeness. Eating this fruit is what is known as original sin. And it became universal sin, meaning that it occurs for each and every one of us. And so this has happened throughout the, the years of the human race. And so it's quite difficult for us to, to deal with this. We find it very difficult to free ourselves from this clinging to positive and clinging to negative, getting deceived by all this positiveness and negativeness. And so our study in practice can be quite difficult at times because of this, for this reason. And so although we know that these things are, are miserable and cause suffering, we're unable to free ourselves from, from their power. For example, we know that love causes all kinds of difficulties and problems. If we really like something and cling to it, then it becomes a trap for us and we, we go, have to go through all kinds of misery because of it. Or the opposite, not liking things, disliking things, hating things. This this is also a lot of suffering because it in, entraps us and we have to go through all kinds of hassles because of this. All these forms of loving and hating or liking and disliking are tr cause tremendous problems for us. We begin to see this, but we're still unable to free ourselves from this, this power. This is the situation we're in. When, whenever there is loving or hating or liking and disliking, then there arises some kind of selfishness. When something is positive, it leads to liking it, loving it, and then we become selfish about getting that thing. Or if something is negative, then this leads to disliking it, hating it, to the degree that we would go and kill someone because of this this disliking and hating. All this liking and disliking, hating and loving are the 
lead to selfishness and are the basic cause or foundation for all our problems. All this positive and negative keeps, keeps us spinning around in selfishness. And this leads to all kinds of hassles and difficulties. Once there's liking and disliking, then this leads to things like fear, worry, anxiety, getting excited, and all kinds of things. We worry about things that hasn't come yet, haven't come yet, and we, we, we think about, we dwell upon things that have passed. This is all because of liking and disliking, which are forms of selfishness. And so it's necessary to get beyond all of this, all this positive and negative, because it just keeps causing us problems. And this life that is beyond positive and negative, we can call the new life. However, this is just a word we use. In fact, it's not really new. It's, it's ori the original life. It's existed for countless, countless centuries. But since for us, we, it's something that we don't know, when we meet it anew, it sounds like something completely new. So we call it the new life, although it's not really so new. This life that is beyond and free of positive and negative is the new life that we, we ought to get to know, we ought to realize. When there's liking and loving, then we want to pull things in, gather them in. When there's disliking and hating, we're, we're trying to push things away to get rid of them, even destroy them. If we live our lives under the influence of this liking and disliking, then life is just push and pull, pushing and pulling all the time. Is that kind of life enjoyable? Does, does a life of push and pull make you happy? <clears throat> this is something that you should examine carefully. Does all this push and pull make you happy? So this is what we need to study in order to, to find a life that is free of all the pushing and pulling. Gladness is not, is not at all restful. It's very active, very busy. And then sadness is neither a kind of rest. It's, it's also quite busy. Both gladness and sadness keep the mind spinning around. Happiness and suffering as well are very busy for the mind. They don't, they don't give the mind, don't give life any rest. So for this reason, we're interested in that which is beyond happiness and suffering, which is completely above this happiness and suffering. This is the object of our study and the goal of our practice. When something, when there is a feeling that something is positive, and then there's liking that thing, this leads to the defilements of, of lust and greediness. Just having to have that thing, desperately wanting that thing. This is a kind of pulling inward. And then if these, these are the first kinds of positive defilements of the mind, lust, raka, and greed, lopa. Then there's also negative kinds of defilements of the mind, things that pollute and defile the mind. And that's when something is taken as positive. Then, then there is a pushing away, a wanting to get rid of, which takes the form of, of tosa, hatred, and kota, anger. These, this anger and hatred is a negative kind of defilement. These negative and positive defilements torment us quite a bit in life. And in spite of that, there's, there's still another kind of <coughs> defilement. There's a third kind, 
when the mind doesn't know or can't figure out or can't decide whether something is positive or negative. If it thinks it's positive, it, it gets greedy. If the mind thinks it's negative, then the mind gets angry or, or hateful. But if the mind can't decide or figure it out, then it becomes confused. So the, the third kind of mental defilement is confusion, which is the mind running around in, in circles, trying to con attach to something but unable to understand it. Because of these three kinds of defilements, we're, we're constantly kept off balance and we, we don't have any chance to rest in life because of all this greed, lust, anger, hatred, confusion, and delusion. We don't have a chance to rest. And so we're, we're always tired. We're always tired in life, always weary. This is a situation that we ought to resolve. For these defilements, there are dozens, hundreds, even thousands of names if one wants to distinguish and separate them up. One can come up with thousands of, of, type, of names of defilements. But if we summarize them, then there are only three basic defilements. There is the greed and lust kind, the anger and hatred kind, and the delusion kind. The one of pulling in, pulling in all the time. The one of pushing away. And then the third is running in circles. All of these, these are disturbances for the mind. If we like something, this liking, this loving things, leads to the one kind of positive defilement. Disliking and hating is the second. But if we're uncertain, if we're, we wonder whether it's positive or negative, this leads to the third kind, a running around in circles. This word uncertain is very important. Because of our uncertainty about things, there occurs confusion and delusion. And this keeps us <coughs> off balance. Buddhism aims to completely eliminate all uncertainty. And by eliminating uncertainty, then we can be free of all these defilements. Any kind of bad mood, bad temper, or harmful emotion are just one are just various forms of these three defilements and it's the object of buddhism to 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 free humanity of these things when there is any kind of uncertainty or doubt then it's impossible to stop wanting to stop desiring if if we're uncertain about something there will always be a kind of wanting. We don't know whether it's positive and we should like it or negative and we should hate it. And so we'll always be uncertain about it and full of desires. For example, not knowing whether this is enough or not or if this is good or bad. This will always be coming because of this certainty. And so the mind keeps running around in circles. For example, a millionaire. A millionaire might have accumulated piles and piles of money and still there will be uncertainty. Is this enough? Is, if, is all this money enough yet? Or uncertainty whether this is really good. Is this good enough? This kind of uncertainty can be very tormenting. And so we need to get free free of this. And if we can free ourselves of all this uncertainty, we can also get free of, of the liking and disliking. And so we need <clears throat> a high level of knowledge or jnana in order to, to free ourselves of this uncertainty. The highest kind of knowledge there is in order to deal with this situation in Buddhism is called Atamayata, Atamayata, 
Now this is probably a word that sounds strange to you because although it appears in the Buddhist scriptures, nobody talks about it, nobody teaches it. But this word atamayata is very, very powerful. The meaning of it is the state where nothing can affect the mind. If the mind is in this state of atamayata, then nothing can affect it, nothing can, can condition it, nothing can concoct that mind. And so then that mind is completely free of positive and negative. If the mind doesn't have this atamayata, then there will be uncertainty about things. And that uncertainty will concoct the mind, will stir it up and send it spinning off in various directions. So atamayata is the highest level of knowledge which allows the mind to, to be free, to be liberated from positive and negative and from all these, these defilements, especially that of uncertainty. Ajahn Buddha Dasa had me check through some of the, the dictionaries of Buddhism that have been published in the West and none of them have anything about Adamayada which is really quite pathetic because in the scriptures this word appears in very important places but then these Western scholars who have compiled these dictionaries left out this very very important word so it seems that unfortunately they they didn't understand Buddhism very well, especially this, this most important word. So we'd like to advise you not to make the same mistake. This word atamayata has the highest meaning. It's extremely powerful and can, can help us tremendously. This atamayata is when the mind is, is dwelling or is living in a way that nothing Nothing can concoct it, nothing can, can mess it up. This is the highest knowledge that we need in order to free ourselves from all problems. When the mind sees atamayata, when the mind has this, this understanding, then nothing positive or negative can touch the mind. In fact, there's nothing that is positive or negative when the mind has Adamayada. Nothing is good or pos good or bad or any of these things. And so in this Adamayada, the self, the ego, cannot arise. All these this I and mine and he and she and you and her and him, all this all this stuff cannot occur when there is a Dhammayada, when the mind sees <coughs> a Dhammayada. All suffering, all misery arises because of the self, because of the ego. As soon as there is a sense of self, of being an, a separate individual, as soon as we think, have this concept or feel that we exist separately, then there will be selfishness. And this selfishness, inevitably in all situations, causes suffering, brings misery into, into life. But this, this sense of self, this sense of me, of being a separate person or individual, all this I and mine and you and he and she and her and him, all this positive and negativeness cannot occur if there is not, if there is a Dhammayada. We only become selfish because we don't see, we don't understand a Dhammayada. So this is how, how crucial this, this truth is. When you don't have a Dhammayada, you can travel around the world as many times as you want and you'll never find any rest. You can keep looking but without a Dhammayada, you'll never find any rest, any peace. But as soon as one has a Dhammayada, 
then one can find peace, one can, can rest, because this adamayada will allow the mind to be free, to be unaffected by all the things that disturb it, which, which hurt it, which annoy it, and which prevent any peace, any, any ability to relax. And so it's essential to understand Adamayata. So please consider the words resting place of struggling souls. Our lives, our, our souls are constantly embattled, constantly struggling all the time. Looking, trying to find, desperately in search of a resting place, a place where we can truly rest in which we, we never find. Adamayada is this is this resting place that we so so desperately need. It's the 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 place of peace amidst all the struggle and conflict and stress that that disturb us so much and send us traveling around the world. And so this is this is something we'd like you to consider finding a place for where the mind can be free of all self, free of all ego. When the mind is beyond all ego and selfishness, this is the resting place of struggling souls, which we find in Adamayata. Some, some people talk about at the highest thing as being saved and then being united with God. But to speak in this way has a, a positive flavor, a positive quality about it. In Buddhism, we, we, don't want, we don't see things as being either positive or negative. Instead, we use the, liberate, the word liberation, being liberated from all suffering, all misery, from all positive and negative. In Pali, this is the word vimuti, vimuti, and this has no, this has nothing positive and nothing negative about it. It's beyond all positive and negative. And so we we suggest that you you look into this carefully and see if this isn't the goal of life to find that which is beyond positive and negative in order to live completely free of positive and negative so that these things are no longer pulling at the mind, disturbing the mind. This, this thing or this state which is free of positive and negative, we can call, we can say it is void. It's empty of positive and negative. And so sometimes we talk about voidness that which is neither positive nor negative, good nor bad. This thing we call voidness or emptiness, you can see that obviously it's something that has no dimensions. And so something, something that is dimensionlessness, you could never call it positive or negative. It's totally free of positive and negative. This, this voidness. This is what the, the state that the mind can realize in order to be, to be absolutely, absolutely free. This, this voidness has nothing positive or negative about it, and it is, it is the highest kind of liberation. Now, in the the Pali language, we use the words sunya for void or empty and sunyata for voidness or emptiness. Now, these words in English, voidness and emptiness, they're not perfect translations, but they're good enough to start with. They're the best words we've got so far to explain these things. And so you can start with these voidness and emptiness and then investigate it for yourself and then find out what the best translation 
of these words would be. And from sunyata, voidness, we come to the word nibbana, nibbana in the Pali language or nirvana in the Sanskrit language. In Thai, it's called nipan. This is the sumambhanam, the utmost goodness of Buddhism. But one shouldn't go to think that it's something positive. People are always trying to turn things into something positive so that they can attach to it. But Nibbana is, has nothing positive or negative about it. It's completely free of these. When this mind is free of all positive and negative, then it comes to Nibbana, the, the place of perfect peace. So don't even bother calling it the utmost goodness. If we call Nibbana the utmost goodness, then we'll go and take it as something positive. But Nibbana is completely beyond all good. It's beyond even the highest good. Nibbana has nothing to do with good because good will always trap the mind. And Nibbana is when the mind is totally free. So it's no need to think of Nibbana in terms of goodness. It's completely beyond positive and negative. However, we have to just, we have to try and explain these things to to ordinary people, and so sometimes we use words like good and words like happy, because otherwise ordinary people won't understand what we're we're talking about. But in the end, to understand nibbana properly, you you have to understand that it has nothing to do at all with anything good or bad, positive or negative. If we understand Nibbana in this way, then it can lead us to freedom, or we can actually realize true Nibbana. If we attach to something as good, then it bites. If we attach to something as bad, then it bites. They Good and bad bite in different ways. But as soon as we attach to something as either good or bad, it's, it's going to bite. It's going to be painful and difficult. As soon as there's any kind of attachment to anything, then the mind is, is going to be heated up, stirred up. And this is pain. This is suffering and misery. Nibbana is the state that is absolutely, perfectly, totally free of all attachment. There, in Nibbana there's no clinging to anything as good or bad, as I and mine, as anything. This, this is the state of freedom that we ought to get to know. This word Nibbana, which is free of all positive and negative, literally means coolness. Nibbana means the state where there's no liking and disliking, good and bad, negative and positive, we call coolness. This has nothing to do with death. You may have been told or something mistakenly that Nibbana means death. This is absolutely wrong. To think that one can be freed by death can be freed from the positive, the negative, the good and the bad by, and from all its suffering by death is, is crazy. If one's going to save oneself by suicide, that, that's lunatic. Nibbana has nothing to do with death. It just means coolness, coolness, and it comes from wisdom, from seeing things as they, as they truly are, so that we no longer cling to positive and negative. Nibbana literally means coolness. That's, it means a coolness where there's no heat, where not, nothing is burning the mind. This can't happen by dying. There can't be coolness. Death can never lead to, to coolness. Death is just another kind of, of heat. Nibbana is when there is 
the mind isn't grabbing onto anything. And so there's nothing positive or negative biting the mind. When positive negative bites the mind, that makes the mind hot. That's suffering. Nibbana is these, the absence of suffering of all these things biting the mind. And so we call it, it coolness. It comes about through the wisdom that we call atamayata, atamayata, where nothing, where the mind won't, atamayata won't let anything bite the mind. It won't let anything positive or negative influence or affect the mind. Atamayata is an ineffectiveness, <coughs> ineffectiveness of, of mind. So we hope that you will understand this what we're saying about Nibbana. If you do, then you'll understand correctly what the goal of life is, and you'll have a map so that you can walk the path of life correctly. The, when, when something is positive, then it bites and there is suffering. When something is negative, then it bites and there is suffering. The essence of this matter is attachment. Attaching to this is bad, this is good, this is positive, this as negative. As soon as there is attachment, then there is biting and burning and suffering. This is the inevitable law of how it works. So the essence here is attachment. Attachment comes from ignorance, from not understanding things as they truly are. Freeing ourselves of this attachment, no longer attaching to things as good and bad, positive and negative, I and mine or whatever. This, this is how we can know Nibbana, by being free of attachment through non-attachment, then we can know Nibbana. Although this is something very profound, we are still able to teach it to children by helping them to see the things that bite them in their ev everyday life. So first we have to help children to see love and see how love or liking bites them. And then show them how hatred is hot, how hatred bites. To help children observe hatred is the second one. Next is anger. When there is anger, how does it bite? Hmm. And then next is fear. When there is fear, how does it bite? How, how does fear prevent any possibility of rest and peace? Next is excitement. When there's excitement, there can't be any calm, any peace. How does this excitement disturb and, and hassle the mind? Next is worry and anxiety, which is always about the future, about we've clinging to the future and then through this attaching, then there's all kinds of worry and anxiety about what might happen or what might not happen. How does this, how does this bite and claw? And then thinking of past things, remembering and dwelling upon and feeling a sense of loss regarding the past. This, this interferes with life quite a bit also. And then there's envy. What is envy like? And also look, who does it bite first? When there's envy, does it bite the person who's envy, envious, or does it in bite the, the person who we're envy, envious of? Obviously, it bites we who are envious first. The next one is jealousy. But in Thai, there are two words. There's hung and huang. huang. Huang is more general. It's a general kind of jealousy. Hung 
is a specific kind of very possessive jealousy about sexual things, specifically one's lover, one's husband or wife or whatever. There are these two kinds, a general jealousy about things and then the specific sexual jealousy and how, how very powerful these are and how, look and see how they, how they bite. Although there are many more examples we can give, these so far are enough to, to give you an idea of what Nibbana is about. Nibbana is when there is a coolness where none of these fires that we've mentioned are biting the mind, are burning the mind. This is Nibbana. This is something, if we look at it in this way, that even a child can understand. Although, although Nibbana is the most profound thing that we can know in human life, we can still explain it to children. The coolness where none of these fires are burning the mind in the least way. Everything in the world is ready to be taken, either as positive or negative. As soon as we grab on and attach to things as positive or negative, then they burn and there is, there is suffering. The suffering takes various forms that we've just mentioned. There's, there's love, there's love or liking, hatred, anger, fear, worry and anxiety, excitement, possessiveness and so on. The world is, is just positive and negative. And for this reason in Buddhism, we say that when the mind is above positive and negative, that it's above the world, it's beyond the world, it's ultra-mundane or to have transcended the world. You should consider this very carefully. Although our bodies are always in the world, we can be above the world when the mind is, is free is no longer grasping at positive and negative. These words are probably most strange for you to, to say above the world within the world, above the world within the world. This may, may sound somewhat strange, but when the mind isn't attaching to anything as positive or negative, then that's to be beyond the world within the world. It's just, there's no way of not being in the world, but without any of this attachment there is being above the world while in the world, beyond the world within the world, or we can say in the world but beyond it, in the world and not of it, in the world above it. Now please don't think that what we're saying is illogical that to be above the world within the world is is something illogical if one is if the mind is beyond positive and negative isn't clinging to good and bad then you'll see that there's nothing illogical about being beyond the world while living in the world being above the world while living within the world there's nothing illogical about this. In fact, this is, this is just the state that we call new life. This is what Buddhism takes as its goal, this new life. We call it new life because for those who ha don't know it yet, it's something very new. But once one knows it, then one sees that there's, it's not really new at all, that people have known about this new life, this kind of life, this way of life for thousands of years. But until we know it for ourselves, it may sound strange and it's something very new. But this, this new life, free of positive and negative, this is what Buddhism is about. We hope that you are, will be successful in, in your coming here and taking the time and put out the effort to come and spend some time here. We hope you'll be very successful in realizing the new life.
And so, at this time, we've we've used up all today. Our, we've used up today's time, and we'll end the talk at right now.